Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 30th anniversary of the 1990 Michigan Conference on Race and the Incidents of Environmental Hazards. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel of environmental justice experts on, with us on, today. Uh, I want to begin by saying that uh, 2020 is also the 50th anniversary, or, a, anniversary of Earth Day in which the University of Michigan and the School for Environment and Sustainability, or SEAS, also played a major role. Before 1970, the, the public's concern about the environment was growing, particularly about air and water pollution, leading to the passage of groundbreaking laws such as the National Environmental Policy Act and the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments, as well as the creation of the U.S. Environmental uh, Protection Agency. However, it was, it was not for almost another 20 years before public awareness began to emerge that these laws were not protecting everyone equally or in the same way. Several e events began to change that. First were the Warren County protests in the early 1980s, which gained national attention. These protests involved predominantly African-American communities in Warren County, North Carolina, who organized to protest a state plan to place a PCB hazardous waste landfill in their community. One of those involved in the protests is on the stage with us today. At the time, Charles Lee was working for the Commission for Racial Justice of the United Church of Christ, an organization which helped the residents of Warren County to mobilize. Several, several years later, Mr. Lee was the principal author of the landmark study entitled Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. Bernice Miller Travis, also a major contributor to the report, I believe is in the audience somewhere. Um, maybe not. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, that same year, I started my position at, uh, at the School for Environment and Sustainability, and it is here where I met my colleague, uh, Dr. Bunyan Bryant who was already studying and teaching courses about social injustice and environmental advocacy. He gave me a report that changed my life. It was Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. From that point on, Dr. Bryant and I began working together, beginning by searching uh, for quantitative uh, studies with similar findings. In that search, two names kept coming up over and over again, Robert D. Bullard, and Beverly Wright, who are also on the stage. Their articles pulled no punches about calling out the racism and injustices that lead to disproportionate environmental burdens and disparate neg negative health outcomes on African Americans and other people of color. Since 1990, environmental justice has become firmly established as an academic field of study cutting across multiple disciplines. In 1992, the School for Environment and Sustainability became the first academic institution to offer degrees in environmental justice. Only two years later, we reached a significant milestone in environmental justice history. On Fe February 11, 1994, President Clinton signed the Environmental Justice Executive Order, calling on all the agencies of the federal go government to take into account the environmental justice consequences of their actions. This exec executive order became the nation's high watermark on federal environmental justice policy and remains so to this day. Most recent policy developments on environmental justice have been at the state level. The very first environmental justice public advocate for the state of Michigan is Ms. Regina Strong, who is also on the stage. The state is also currently considering adoption of an environmental justice cumulative impact assessment tool the model for which was built by a team of C students in partnership with the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, coordinated by C's alumna, Michelle Martinez, who will be serving as our moderator for this evening's panel. At the national level, we have heard a lot of, of, about the Green New Deal, and a principal architect, Rihanna Gunn-Wright, is also on the stage with us tonight. Thanks to the contributions of the environmental justice movers and shakers on this stage, and in this audience, and many others elsewhere, environmental justice has come a long way in the past 30 years. But it still has a long way to go. The problems are now well known, but we need the will to solve them. And hopefully we can, with the momentum built here in the state of Michigan and elsewhere around the country. I hope tonight re-energizes re the movement 
and, and serves as a call to action. Before I, I turn things over to uh, Michelle, uh, I'd like to um, uh, make some acknowledgments. Uh, there's a number of people who participated in the 1990 conference uh, who are sitting in the audience, so, so I would like to acknowledge them. Uh, first and foremost is my longtime friend and colleague, Professor Bunyan Bryant, who's sitting right here. Bunyan, can you stand? If, when I call your names, if you wouldn't mind, stand for just a second. <laughs> Professor Bryant is an environmental justice giant, and he and I, uh, one of the projects that we worked together very early on when we met each other was to uh, co-organize the 1990 Michigan Conference. I would also like to recognize Professor James uh, Crowfoot. Is, uh, Jim, are you out there somewhere? <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> uh, Professor Crowfoot was the dean of the school at the time of the 1990 conference, and he gave a, a Dr. Bryant and me substantial support throughout the effort. And I'm, I'm talking not just financial, but also a lot of moral support behind what we were doing. In addition, I would like to recognize my colleague, Professor Dorsita Taylor. Is she here? <laughs> She's way in the back. At the, time, at the time we held our conference, um, uh, Dr. Taylor was a graduate student at Yale, uh, who, but was an active participant at our, con at our conference. She's now a full professor and colleague in the School for Environment and Sustainability, and she herself is a very important environmental justice pioneer. In addition, we have Dr. Michael Galopter. Um, Michael, are you, where are you? Michael. Where is he? I can't. I don't know. Well, I know he's here, so anyway. <laughs> he's going to get an acknowledgement anyway. Uh, he was also a participant in the conference, and he was a member of the um, uh, eight representatives from the conference that met with Administrator, Administrator William Riley in September of 1990. After that meeting, we were called the Michigan Co Coalition, and he was one of the eight that went to that meeting. Uh, he's also, also the author of Lean Startups for Social Change, and he's cu the current Director of Sustainability and Innovation Practices at InfoEdge. In addition, I would like to recognize Professor Connor Bailey. Is he? Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> um, he also was one of the original participants in, in 1990. He's currently an, an Emeritus Professor of Rural Sociology at Auburn. And he pioneered one of the earliest studies examining environmental justice issues in Sumter, Alabama. In addition, we have former Deputy Assistant Administrator of Policy for the EPA, Rob Walcott. And, and Rob, if you could stand too. Uh, <coughs> um, <laughs> Rob played a critical role in getting the EPA to pay attention to environmental justice and to get it onto to the EPA's uh, policy agenda. Uh, I, I, I see Rob as one of the unsung heroes. Uh, 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 if it were not for Rob, uh, I don't know if it, EPA would have finally paid attention to the issue, but it wouldn't have paid attention to the issue as early as it did without him. And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Miss Bernice Miller Travis, but she's not here. She is. Where is she? She got here. Thank you. <laughs> there she is. Okay. <laughs> I want people to know she, that she uh, worked on toxic waste and race in the United States uh, along with uh, uh, Mr. Charles Lee, and she was a member of the Michigan Coalition uh, in the early 1990s. I want you to uh, please uh, uh, join me in giving them a round of applause and acknowledgement for their contributions to this important work. And I, I have to add that it has been an incredible honor to work with these people. Um, and I'm, and and almost everyone that I mentioned is still very active today, uh, and their contributions cannot be understated. 
Finally, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge the planning committee who put an enormous amount of time and effort uh, to make this all uh, happen today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, Professor Tony Reams, uh, for his leadership in making tonight happen. I'd like to thank Dean Jonathan Overpeck. I'd like to thank the C's communication team, uh, uh, Carol Love and Amy Novak. Um, I don't know how you guys sleep at night, uh, <laughs> but they did, they did an amazing job. And I also want to acknowledge the environmental justice students who also helped make this event possible. All right, now we're going to move on to the panel, and I'm going to introduce our moderator, Ms. Michelle Martinez. Ms. Martinez is an environmental justice activist, writer, and mother of two, born in the Latinx diaspora of Southwest Detroit. Since 2006, she has worked in local communities of color to build power to halt climate change and detrimental effects in Detroit. Working across issues of race, gender, and nationality, she has built and led co coalitions using art and media, urban agriculture, popular education, voter engagement, and corporate accountability tactics to shape policy solutions. Last, she organized 2,500 people to march for the Green New Deal during the second Democratic debate in Detroit last July with the Frontline's Detroit Coalition. Currently, she is the statewide coordinator for the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, which advocates for environmental justice within communities disproportionately impacted by environmental toxins. In 2019, she received the award of Top 25 Latinx from the State of Michigan Hispanic Latino Commission. She earned her master's degree from the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment, now sees, and was a former student of Professor Bunyan Bryan. So Michelle, I'm gonna pass things on to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I know you could be doing a thousand other things, and you chose to come here, so I share my gratitude um, with you. And uh, the university itself, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the University of Michigan for <coughs> allowing me the privilege to have the exposure and the access to environmental justice. Um, being in Southwest Detroit, I didn't know. I didn't know the impact that the trucks were having on our lives, that the highways was a systemic issue of displacement. And now I'm a part of a huge community, many of whom are here today. So I want to acknowledge the other environmental justice activists and advocates in the room um, who I would be nothing without them. So thank you all for being here and, and sharing your time and your life and your, your commitment with me. So um, one thing not on my resume, I worked in the service industry for a dozen years. <laughs> and I waited on thousands of people. And uh, I also waited on famous people. I waited on rock stars and movie stars. But I was never nervous in front of them. I'm nervous tonight because these are the rock stars of our movement. Yes. <laughs> Yes, um, many of whom um, I read about in school and I, and I admired and looked up to up to this point. So I'm going to try to get through the bios without shivering and quaking and crying <laughs> because this is amazing. <laughs> or fangirling at any moment. So, <laughs> okay, Dr. Robert Bullard. <laughs> Known as the father of environmental justice. Dr. Robert Bullard is a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University in Houston. He's the co-founder of HBCU Climate Change Consortium and author of 18 books that address environmental racism, urban land use, housing, transportation, sustainability, smart growth, climate justice, and community resilience. Dr. Bullard is the recipient of numerous awards and honors in 1990, including National Wildlife Federation Conservation Achievement Award in science for his book, Dumping in Dixie. In 2008, Newsweek named him one of 13 environmental leaders of the century. 
In 2013, Sierra Club honored him with the John Muir Award, and in 2014, named its new EJ Award after Dr. Bullard. In 2015, the American Bar Association presented him with its Environmental Energy and Resources Stewardship Award. In 2017, the Children's Environmental Health Network presented him with the Child Health Advocate Award. In 2018, the Global Climate Action Summit named Dr. Bullard one of 22 climate trailblazers. And in 2019, Apolitical named him one of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. Please welcome Dr. Bullard. Charles Lee. Charles Lee is widely recognized as a true pioneer in the area of environmental justice. He was the principal author of the landmark report, Toxic Wastes and Race in the United States, and helped to spearhead the emergence of a national environmental justice movement and federal action, including the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit and the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. <laughs> 30 years ago, he presented at U of M conference Race and the Incident of Environmental Hazards, which we commemorate today. Mr. Lee is currently the policy, Senior Policy Advisor for Environmental Justice at the EPA and has led the development and implementation of EPA's agency-wide environmental justice st strategic plans. He is the recipient of numerous awards for his work. And in February 2017, the 122nd session of the South Carolina House of Representatives passed a resolution to honor his lifetime of accomplishments in environmental justice and contributions to the bettering <coughs> the lives of communities in that state. Please welcome Mr. Charles Lee. Rihanna Gunwright, one of the lead architects of the Green New Deal, a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, a think tank in Chicago, a global distributed network of academics, creators, activists, leaders, and entrepreneurs. She was previously the policy director for Abdul El Sayed's 2018 gubernatorial campaign. <laughs> A 2013 Rhodes Scholar, Ms. Gunn-Wright has also worked as the policy analyst for the Detroit Health Department, the Miriam K. Chamberlain Fellow of Women in Public Policy at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and as a policy intern in the former First Lady Michelle Obama. Ms. Gunn-Wright graduated magna cum laude from Yale in 2011 with majors in African American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Please welcome Ms. Gunn-Wright. <laughs> Regina Strong is an effective advocate for change, and she currently serves as the environmental justice public advocate in the executive office of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Previously, she served as the director of the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign in Michigan. In that role, she led an effort to transition the state's energy generation away from coal dependency to clean, renewable energy. During her tenure with the club, she worked with the Beyond Coal campaign team to achieve retirement announcement for six coal plants in Michigan. For more than 30 years, Regina has been a leader in the public affairs and advocacy arena. She has held executive leadership positions in private, nonprofit, and public sectors. Her numerous leadership positions include Director of Public Relations and Global Communications for EDS, VP of Marketing and Chief Operating Officer for North Star Community Development, Director of Communications for March of Dimes, Southeast Michigan Chapter, and Executive Director for the Community Development Advocates of Detroit and President of the Stronger Image. Please welcome Ms. Regina Strong.
lastly and certainly not least, Dr. Beverly L. Wright. <laughs> okay, this is so cool. Um, Dr. Beverly L. Wright is the founder and executive director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, which addresses environmental and health inequities along the Louisiana-Mississippi River Chemical Corridor and the Gulf Coast region. The center is a community university partnership organization providing education, health, and safety training and job placement for residents in environmental justice and climate impacted communities within the United States. Dr. Wright has conducted groundbreaking and significant research in the area of environmental justice and developed a curriculum for the use at elementary school level that has been used in the New Orleans public schools. She manages hazardous waste worker training programs that embrace a work-based curriculum and a holistic approach to learning for young men and women living near Superfund and Brownfield sites. Among Dr. Wright's numerous awards and recognitions, she received the 2008 EPA Achievement Award, the prestigious 2009 Heinz Award, and was named by the Griots as one of the 100 history makers in the making in 2010. She is the author of numerous scholarly, scholarly books and articles. She co-authored Race, Place, and the Environment After Hurricane Katrina, and The Wrong Complexion for Protection, How the Government Response Endangers African American Communities. Please welcome Ms. Dr. Beverly Wright. <laughs> This is awesome. <laughs> so when I came in, it was really sitting in Dr. Bunyan Bryant's class, and there was a name for environmental justice. And um, I really am so eager to hear where this began, before there was a name for environmental justice. And I'm going to ask Dr. Wright to kick us off. What motivated you and brought you into this work? And how has it changed, really, over the last 30 years? Well, so the last shall be first. First question comes to me, right? <laughs> you can have it. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's really wonderful uh, to be back um, at the University of Michigan. I'm really overwhelmed with seeing Dr. Bunyan Bryan. I was looking for your bunion. I had to put my glasses on so I could find you <laughs> in the seat. It's just so wonderful to see everyone. So um, I began in this work um, really not expecting to be here. And I attended the State University of New York at Buffalo, and I was working with Dr. Addie Levine, who was my major professor uh, in graduate school, who was working on the Love Canal incident. And so I began to learn a little bit about communities being poisoned. But these were all white communities. This community was all white. There were no people of color there. It was just a white community. And I was working with Addie, um, who, who passed away about two years ago at almost 90, um, working with her, interviewing people, you know, finding out what their problems were, and just being introduced to advocacy around uh, toxic poisoning. Um, and then I returned to New Orleans and was teaching at the University of New Orleans. And Addie would come down, and she wanted to present the work on Love Canal to her, to my students. And then I met Dr. Bullard at um, a conference, a Southern, I think it was a Southern um, Mid -South. socio, Mid oh, sorry. He's a historian, <laughs> not me. The Mid-South <laughs> Sociological Association meeting and um, just over a period of time, you know, talking, he said he was doing some work in Louisiana. And he, he explained to me what he was doing and, you know, trying to get a grant to do it and asked me if I would 
you know, come help him with that work, assist him in what he was doing. I was working on teen pregnancy at the time. And um, as time went on, the teen pregnancy work went to the side because the environmental work was bigger. And at some point with communities in Louisiana, you know, just really beginning to start a revolution over the amount of pollution that was existing in that corridor, I was pulled into it. I didn't lead it, I was pulled into that work. First with Bob saying he needed help, and then Louisiana turning out to be just so god awful that um, green groups didn't want to work there. They said it was a waste of time. And the community was, was so sick and um, no one was helping them, but I began to really look around and notice that it was just black people who were living closest to these facilities, which was the first, ended up being the first research project that I worked on in EJ, that's looking at the spatial distribution of toxic, toxic facilities by race. And so I kind of started making that connection. So my first introduction to toxins of poison communities was with Addie Levine in Buffalo, New York. It was Niagara Falls. So I, I saw that, but in Louisiana, we always, I grew up believing that the chemical plants were good. It was a source of income. My dad would say when we drive from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and that really awful smell from the chemical plants like rotten eggs, you know, you would smell it. And we would play around and talk about how awful it was and point to one another saying they passed gas or something. You know how kids would do. <laughs> And my dad would say, mmm, smells like progress. So making the connection between, you know, this place that was, that was really killing us, uh, killing the environment, killing everything, uh, between that and then remembering what I was taught to believe about it because it brought jobs. Um, and then looking again at who was being poisoned and where. The justice connection came later. So first it was the idea of facilities poisoning communities, but they were white communities. Then realizing that where I lived was a much larger love canal, right? And it was killing everybody to some extent, but a closer look showed us that, you know, black people were the ones most affected and white people were mostly moved further away from they were bought out and moved away from the toxic facility. So that was the beginning. And so different tours, talking with people, where their screens were rusting and falling off the windows in three months, you know. They had cancers and little crosses in front of their houses, four, five, six for people who had died, waking up with nosebleeds. It just went on and on how people were suffering. That's when I made the justice connection. But it was first poisoning of communities, mm -hmm. then making the connection between money and pollution, and then getting to the point where you saw, hmm, something kind of rotten about this. Why are we the only ones living fence line with these communities? And that's when the justice thing started, and that's when I, I was always upset, but I got angry. Um, and that was the beginning of my work with of Dr. Robert Bullard, who always had more work for me to do. And another one of his books, the books just kept coming, coming. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, then recognizing that right where I lived was really the hub of all that was going on down south. And it was a mixture of racism, segregation, Jim Crow, all of that stuff was going on, making us poorer and sicker than our white. Uh, counterparts, and so began, you know, my life working in EJ. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, and as we commemorate the 30th year anniversary in environmental justice here, Dr. Bullard, can you talk a little bit about what that arc has looked like? How have things changed? Some people, I think the panel said, not a whole lot has changed in the community level, but from your vantage point, really, what has the impact of your work and the work over the last 30 years been? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank the uh, University of Michigan f uh, for uh, having this 30-year commemoration. This is, a, uh, this is important. Uh, as we uh, commemorate and celebrate, we also have to rededicate. Um, well, the last 30 years um, has, we've seen a lot change. Uh, I, I started my work in 1978, a long time ago. That's more than 30 years. Um, so you're looking at 40, was that 41? Anyway, if you look at the arc, uh, we have, as a movement, grown, matured, uh, developed uh, intergenerational organizing leadership. Uh, we've expanded the definition of what environmentalism is. Environmentalism is more than, than leisure uh, time activity, something uh, reserved for uh, white middle class. Environmentalism, uh, as we practice in environmental justice, it's for everybody and it, it's inclusive. The environment, as the environmental justice movement redefined it, the environment is where we live, work, play, worship, learn, as well as the physical and natural world. And in terms of looking at this new environmentalism also means self-determination. I think the thing that we developed out of the People of Color Summit, First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, uh, uh, was, was the, the 17 principles. And uh, the core principle is that people most impacted must speak for themselves must be in the room when decisions are being made. And there are very few communities now, uh, as opposed to 30 years ago, that would um, somehow take the position you can't fight City Hall, you can't change things, or whatever. Uh, they're gonna do it anyway. That's the way they've been doing it forever. Uh, you have people now who are resisting. And instead of 30 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, when it was just, um, two or three people uh, or five people that you could count on one hand that's doing this work in isolation. Now there are teams, there are partnerships, there are collaboratives, there are, there's consortia uh, doing work uh, around uh, this intersectionality, whether it's housing, transportation, energy, food security, climate, sustainability, resilience, uh, all of it with an equity justice lens. And I say that any framework that's dealing with the environment, or whether it's dealing with climate, or whether it's dealing with sustainability, or transportation, or, whatever, or energy, that doesn't include justice is inadequate. And domestically as well as globally. So our framework, our environmental justice framework that, uh, that was consolidated and adopted out of the summit uh, and those principles as guiding principles as they were pushed out from 91 to 92 at the Earth Summit uh, in Rio, uh, the, the fact that environmental justice has now been globalized to the point where you go to any UN summit or climate meeting, whatever, the justice part is the one that's the most active the one that's, the, that's pulling things together from various regions of the world. And I think the justice uh, will, uh, will ensure that we overcome a lot of these, uh, these hurdles. Uh, and I've been in meetings where some, well, you know, 10 years ago when we were sitting around the table and there were some people saying, I'm afraid of justice. As a matter of fact, the first EPA, when they did the, the the first environmental justice report in 92, uh, it was called environmental equity, reducing risk for all communities. Um, and then, then this last point I'll stop. After Hurricane Katrina, uh, no, I'm sorry, Hurricane Harvey uh, in 2017, there were, there were like three dozen organizations that got together, groups that never got together at all, but it took a biblical flood to get us together. Uh, we developed this coalition, coalition for environment, equity, and resilience, C-E-E-R. There are groups in the room in 2017 uh, who were afraid of justice. Mm -hmm. They'd rather have equity. And so I think the fact that we have come a long ways, but we still have a long way to go. And I say anybody or any organization, any group 
uh, that's afraid of justice, that runs from justice, watch him. Where are we marching? Let's go. No. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's been so many game changers, right, over the last three decades, and many of us who have been working in the justice field know the oral history, but we're curious, Charles Lee, what do you think has been a major game changer in the last three decades from your work and from the environmental justice movement? Wow. Um, well, first of all, just like Bob and Beverly said, I want to um, thank, um, uh, express my appreciation for the University of Michigan for um, not just for today, uh, but for all the years of work. Uh, and, you know, the, You're the, here. the symposium that, um, that Bunyan and Paul uh, organized was a real um, game changer. And I think, uh, you know, you can trace, um, you know, all the, uh, all the work that has come out of it. Um, but let me not go there right now because I think that's part of, a, and they will say too, that that's part of a long arc of history, you know. And, you know, I, I think that um, when I went down to, I had always been um, interested in issues of race and environment and, and poverty, you know. Uh, but it wasn't until I uh, went down to Warren County uh, during the protests that I really uh, had a sense of the uh, transformative power of the issues, the set of issues, and the, and the movement and the people that were involved. You know, people like Dolly Burwell, uh, who herself got arrested uh, five times, uh, and, you know, many other people that were involved in there. And I think the, you know, what, what, um, what that did was, um, when I was working for the commission and uh, Congressman Fauntroy had asked for a report from the G Governmental Accountability Office uh, following Warren County and found that three out of the four uh, hazardous waste sites in the, in, uh, in the southeast were in predominantly African-American counties. I said, you know, you got to really put this issue on the map. Uh, and I think that's what led to uh, toxic waste and race. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I did say that in the, um, in the um, a 30th anniversary of, uh, of toxic waste and race that it was a game changer. And I, you know, you know, I think Bob and Beverly talked to some of it, but if you look at the overall sweep of how things are different today than it was then, and you know, and I would say, um, I, I think I always, always say, when I first started working on this issue, you didn't have a name. But now, you know, uh, there's, uh, what is it? I think there's like hundreds of university courses in the area. Uh, there's probably thousands of uh, peer-reviewed uh, scientific journal articles in the area. You know, there's like um, environmental justice activities, policies, or statutes in uh, at least 40 states, right? Um, and um, and so I think, I, and, and most importantly, I think that. You know, at the, at the core of this uh, is the way communities have empowered themselves and, and, uh, and made real changes in their communities. And so I think, you know, looking forward, you know, some of this, um, uh, where is this all going to lead to? I think, you know, it's been really hard to try to get um, environmental justice integrated into government policy, into regulations. And, um, and I think now we're just beginning to see, uh, we're beginning to have the tools like uh, EPA's EJ screen or California's Cal Enviro screen, things like that, and um, you know, guidance around how to do, uh, incorporate tool, uh, environmental justice into the rulemaking process, things like that. We're finally beginning to get the tools to begin to um, incorporate this into government policy. And, and that already has, you know, yielded uh, lots of, lots of uh, changes. Uh, and this is where the transformative nature of this comes in. I think, you know, through Cal the use of Cal Viral Screen, billions of dollars are now being directed towards environmental justice communities. You know, and that's just one example. And I think in 2012, when 
Senate Bill 535 uh, was passed in California. You know, I did a, a panel on this. Uh, I brought all the people in Calif involved with that uh, effort, and I said this was a harbinger of the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that it really is, and I think you'll begin to see uh, people across the country working at the state level uh, see, see that, the possibilities, and how they can uh, you know, adapt that in their state. And I think that's what's happening here in Michigan. So I just stopped there because I think, like Bob and Beverly said, you know, um, the world has changed, but it has a lot, we have a lot more work to do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna draw on something Dr. Wright said, which is she was pulled into the movement, you're pulled into it, right? And so I'm gonna turn to Rihanna and ask, really, what is, what's pulling you right into the movement? And, and what would you say about that to other young advocates who are now being pulled into the movement? Yeah, so I also want to thank the University of Michigan for having me. I want to apologize. I'm sick. I know I look like a human, but truly, <laughs> it's 99% Ricola, cold medicine, and extension. So it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so, um, if I'm being completely honest, I got pulled into it because I needed a job. Um, and that's the truth. Um, so, but I had started working on environmental justice uh, issues as a policy analyst at the Detroit Health Department. And I didn't know that that was what it was called. Um, so when I was at the Detroit Health Department, actually my first, a uh, project was to secretly figure out how to take down the incinerator that was in the middle of the city. Um, I did not succeed, so you don't have to clap. <laughs> um, but so we, we worked on that. We you know, worked with uh, community groups around the Gordie Howe Bridge and the community benefit agreements. Um, you know, we worked on you know, there were ongoing lead programs at the department. Um, and so I, I was working on it, and I think for the first time, I started to see um, I th a couple of things. The first is I started to see the depth of what happens when these things are going on and connecting them. Um, and realizing that um, the things that were happening to people had nothing to do with anything except the fact that they were poor and black. Mm -hmm. That was it. Um, and so being in a city where, you know, thousands of people's water is getting shut off and then, you know, in another part of the state, Nestle's paying $2, right, to take out however many gallons of groundwater all the time. Um, it, just the disparities, I think, started to hit me. And then uh, later on, once I was working on the Green New Deal, figuring out that I lived in a frontline community growing up, which I didn't recognize. Um, but so I had done this work and essentially, um, I finished with the Abdul campaign and someone came to me and was like, would you help develop the Green New Deal? And I was unemployed, so I said yes. Um, and, um, and that's how I got pulled in. Um, and that's also how um, I started connecting uh, with more folks and learning more about it and really truly seeing up close how much people wanted to combat the climate crisis without ever touching justice. Uh, and I didn't realize that that tendency was so deep and among so many people that I would have thought of as allies before the Green New Deal came out because the only thing I talked about after the resolution came out, the sort of Green New Deal resolution uh, came out in February was why is equity in here? Yeah. Four months, and I mean this, this was the number one question people asked me for four to five months. And these are folks, and a lot of these were folks who have 
fought against the, the climate crisis their entire careers. This all they wanted to do was um, stop global warming. Uh, and, you know, and they would come to me and be like, well, why would you mix all this stuff together? And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? And they'd be like, we can get to it later. And I'd be like, y'all know I'm a black woman that y'all told us to? Like, uh, where is my 40 acres and a mule? Did we ever get to that? No? Oh. Um, so, so it was, um, so it was odd. And that, I think, made me really angry and even more committed. And for new advocates, I would say do your homework. Uh, I ran into some issues coming into the movement and they were mostly my fault because I didn't do my homework. You know, I thought I had worked on environmental justice before, and but I realized coming in, it was sort of a colonial attitude. I acted like it was a space that was empty instead of a space that was filled with scholarship. And I didn't think I could be colonial because I'm black. <laughs> it's not true. Um, and so, you know, I stuck my foot in it a, a few times. Um, and, and so I would just say, like, recognize that even what's coming forward, like the Green New Deal, the ideas in the Green New Deal are not new. They're just compiled in a different way. They're messaged in a new way, and mostly they're messaged to reach out to new people. Um, but they are coming completely from, particularly a background of environmental justice scholarship. A lot of the things in, that you will read in the resolution are things that folks have been talking about for a really long time. So just do your homework and recognize that like environmental justice is not just a commitment to make sure people are taken care of, it's a lens and a bit of a praxis, right? And so, um, and so you have to read. I, I like recognize like when we first started working on the Green New Deal, we went and talked to experts in transportation, all this. We didn't talk to any environmental justice experts because we didn't think of it as a thing that was also an area of technical expertise and it very much is. Yes, we know this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, if you haven't noticed, Dr. Beverly Wright was one of the first people. I was like, mm, "Girl, what's happening? <laughs> what are you doing?" Um, so, yeah. so yeah. So I would say that, like, do your homework. There's tons of books out there, and also ally yourself with folks who are more experienced. So now, a lot of the people I work closest with are folks who are environmental justice advocates and have been doing it for far longer than me. Um, and in lots of ways, I don't subordinate my work to them, but they are some of the first people that I go to and I try um, to sort of really work in concert with them because I don't know a lot of it, you know, still, because I haven't been in it for years, but yeah, just don't walk in like, there's no one else around. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to come back to the climate issue, right? Climate justice and Green New Deal, but staying on this topic of, you know, riding the fence around scholarship, activism, advocacy, and being in government, being outside of government, and having that, that ability to have an inside and an outside game so that we can really start to institutionalize some of the values that have been laid out. Um, and so, Regina, I'm going to ask you, what and how? <laughs> Regina, tell me, hmm, how do we be good together in an inside-outside game? Like, what is the thing that we need to know so that we're effective uh, with government as advocates and activists? So that's a really good question because my background um, is really in advocacy and public affairs. And so, although I'm part of government now, I wasn't always in that seat. And so it's an interesting place to be now as the movement really takes on another level. I mean, I really came to understand the importance of thinking of justice in everything you do early on in my life, but I didn't know how to harness it. 
So I'm a child of the 70s, and I thought I was going to be a revolutionary. I, uh, you know, went through this period where I was a Angela Davis fro wearing, hoop earring, red, black, and green wearing revolutionary, right? At least not in my head, right? And I was in middle school, and I uh, was going to change the world, and went to a place called the Unity House, and met with. Brother Diablo and some other folks, and they came home and my mom said, where have you been? I said, I was with Brother Diablo. She was like, you were with the devil? And I said, no, I was with Brother Diablo and I was at the Unity House and the revolution is coming and we need to get ready. And she said, the only thing you need to get ready for is dinner. And what I realized then is I had a long way to go as an activist, but I always cared about justice. So, you know, as I went through my life, I grew up in Cleveland and I, in the Cleveland area, it's actually East Cleveland, but anyway, I grew up in that area and when I was a kid, the Cuyahoga River was catching on fire. There was so much industrial pollution and I didn't always make the connection between my life and what I was exposed to and all the steel mills and all the plants and all the things that we drove by every day. And so, I, you know, fast forward to kind of my career life and I was, you know, I was in public affairs and I was in public relations and I was gonna do all these things. And I had the opportunity to work in community development. And what I again witnessed were all the injustices that people experienced in housing, right? And start seeing, you know, there's a cool word for it now, intersectionality, but back then it was just like all these things overlap, right? This justice and this is an injustice and why aren't we doing this? And so it really got me thinking about what I wanted to do as I moved forward. And so I kind of waffled between the money you can make in corporate America and the opportunity to save the world and I was kind of back and forth between those two. And then what I realized once I started working in community development is how many people didn't even know how to advocate for themselves. And so I started to make that connection between how we change things. You know, one of the things that I am in awe of is the ability of the folks in this room and on this panel to be agitators, to bring things forward that people aren't paying attention to. What I learned early on and continue to learn, you know, over the years was that there is a continuum of change, right? And so, but before you can change anything, you have to bring attention to it. So I saw something recently on social media about protesters and how people had issues with protesters. And somebody came back to that comment and said, hey, all of the change of the last century was caused by a protest, was caused by an agitator. You know, that's what got it going. And I believe if you start with agitation, then move on to advocacy, because then you define what it is you're advocating for, right? And then you have to move on to negotiation. You're negotiating with government, with corporations, with the people who are doing the things that are causing harm. And so in a government role, it's very interesting for me. I will fast forward to the time when I ended up at Sierra Club. I'd always been very connected to environmental work and was working on the Beyond Coal campaign and really thought about, as we looked at the coal plants that we were targeting, where they were located, right? And who lived in those communities. I had um, the opportunity to work with an amazing environmental justice trailblazer named Rhonda Anderson. Um, and when I first met Rhonda, I didn't think she liked me too much, right? Because she, she really gave me side eye about why I wanted to know more about certain communities. And it was my thirst for knowledge to understand, you know, how we affect change and how we help people. But Rhonda said, well, first, you got to hear what people have to say. You have to let people speak for themselves. You have to have those conversations. You have to listen. So you need to come with me to these meetings and we're going. And I met people like Teresa Landrum and Dr. Dolores Leonard and people who had been doing this work for a long time for their own survival. And I got a whole different perspective on the work, right? I thought, okay, this is more than just making things better, this is life or death. Mm -hmm. And I started really <coughs> taking it personal, you know, really looking at how can you affect change. 
And so the fight to retire coal plants is, a, is one that I take really seriously because I do believe we need to move forward um, toward renewable energy for a whole host of reasons that we all know in this room. Um, but I also realize we have to do everything we do through a lens of equity. And we have to think about it from a justice standpoint. I know folks probably remember years, uh, several years ago, I can't remember the exact year when there was the big climate march in New York. And there were thousands of people there in the streets. And we wanted to try to replicate something like that um, in the city of Detroit. It was something that the Sierra Club thought was a great idea. And, you know, in our work, we started, you know, trying to work with organizations and work with frontline folks. And it was going to be a climate justice march. And I said, we cannot talk about justice in Detroit without talking about all justice issues. So we had to, again, that intersectionality of climate justice, housing justice, environmental justice, you know, all of the issues that were interconnected. So we built this huge coalition of folks to do a march in Detroit um, that literally brought together kind of all of those justice issues. And folks, you know, part of the challenge in Southeast Michigan, and I'm sure it's a challenge in other places, is that those who um, were experiencing environmental injustices were typically black and brown folks. And many of the climate activists and Sierra Club volunteers that I work with and other folks were, you know, white folks who really want to change the world too, but these groups never talked to each other. And so there were suburban groups that I was dealing with that had the passion to do things. There were groups in Southeast Michigan that were black and brown, they wanted change. And what I realized is those folks rarely talked to each other. And Rhonda and I had a lot of conversations about how to make that happen, other folks at, in other organizations and Sierra Club. So we brought folks together who had never worked together for this justice march. And this is all a backdrop to talk about how change happens. And I think that led to folks having conversations and working together. But the next step in that journey, I had no idea I was gonna take was the role that I'm in now. Because so much of the advocacy before that had been about how do we change how the government looks at this work? How do we get them to do it through a lens of equity? How do we get them to care um, about what's happening to people? Do we have the data? One of the things that Rhonda's really great at is working with frontline communities to understand how to read a permit, how to advocate, what kind of information. You can come with all the emotion, but government is gonna base it on the data, right? So mm. how do you bring that data into the room? And so all of those things kind of come full circle when about a year ago, it's been almost exactly a year ago, you know, the opportunity that, first of all, you know, um, Governor Whitmer, the current governor here in Michigan, um, did an executive order creating the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. I was so excited. I was like, this is great. This is a wonderful Big thing. Win. No idea that it would end up being a position that I would ultimately end up in and also creating an interagency response team, which were all the department heads of departments in the state really looking at, again, environmental justice. I mean, the journey that environmental justice has been on over these years was kind of coming full circle in a government way in Michigan. And so it became very, very exciting opportunity. And then once I actually ended up in this role, it was a big transition for me. I hadn't been in state government before. And I will say, and I'm Charles, I'm sure you, you probably have much more experience in this than I, but the wheels of government move really slow, right? That's, this was a learning for me, didn't realize that. I mean, I knew it was slow, didn't realize it was that slow. And I think part of the challenge is having been an advocate for the last few years, I ended up in meetings with people where I may or may not have yelled at them at a hearing. And so I, <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure in many cases, that was kind of my opening line. So if I yelled at you at a hearing, I'm sorry. And, yes. But what I found in this role is there's a real opportunity, like you said, Michelle, to have that inside outside game, to really look at how can government be at that negotiations end of change mm -hmm. and really creating the vehicle for us to do some of the things that have been advocated for for decades, mm -hmm. like looking at a screening tool, like yes. the opportunity to have folks thinking ahead of time 
on how you marshal resources to help communities. And so I think it's an exciting time in Michigan in particular yes. Yes, to really is. move some of that forward Absolutely. because there are conversations happening that I think um, in my former life, we only like prayed to happen, right? Like we so were... let's let's talk about the exciting yeah. time in Michigan yeah. because the the role of the scholar activist is really important. And yes. as we stand in uh, University of Michigan halls, yeah. we know that a lot of the people involved have been really pushing with research. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about the role of the scholar activist, Dr. Wright. Could you speak a little bit about how research has played a critical role in change? And, and uh, maybe also we can hear from, yeah, thanks. Well, the, the role of the uh, scholar activist is one um, that unlike the applause that we received in this room, I'm more <laughs> accustomed to getting hisses <laughs> as I walked in. Where, yeah. And people say, mm, here she goes. That's really what we met when we first started, uh, you know, trying to do what, what, what we, we've done. So the, the role of the scholar activist is extremely important uh, because co what communities need um, is information. They, we, we, they, we need to, and, and we saw that, and I'm talking about Dr. Bullitt and myself, um, we really saw um, a need for communities to be educated and trained to advocate for themselves. Now, how does a poor community do this? You know, it's very difficult because they don't have access to researchers, you know, who research for their benefit rather than research for tenure, which is what most scholars do when it comes to doing research with communities. And so this whole notion of uh, community, which is what we started, what year was that, Bob? He knows 92. the years, I don't. It's been a long 92. time. And 92, 1992, the community model that, that we have both been working with for the last uh, nearly 30 years was about finding ways to uh, give communities access to real information that could make a difference. And our journey was a, was a long one. Mm. Um, and then that information was then used to work with uh, federal and state agencies to bring about change. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Environmental Protection Agency's first um, grant, I think it was $250,000, Charles, for Community, um, Cup the Cup Grant, Community University Partnership, mm -hmm. was actually based on um, my center's model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in talking with EPA and, and saying, you know, this is what we'd like to do. We need to have researchers working with communities, uh, developing uh, classes, uh, modules for them to to uh, understand the toxins and also, even more important than that, knowing who to call when something happens. So we developed all of these classes and began doing our work and it began to work. And the COP uh, program, which really came about, I think really because of the interaction that was going on with this group, but the Michigan group in particular, Mm. Because of that work and the last recommendation with the Michigan group was that they develop environmental justice centers across the country, but mostly in the Deep South and at HBCUs and then in places where there were no HBCUs, universities so inclined to do so, which would have been certainly the University of Michigan. Yeah. So the, the, drive, the driver for getting government to begin working with communities, you know, giving grants on community training actually came from what I would call um, scholar advocates. Yes. And uh, Paul Mohai and, and Bunyan Bryan pulled us together. We thought Charles Lee was black because the only Lee we knew was a black Lee. So we were stunned <laughs> when he was Chinese when he showed up. We still <laughs> laugh about that. I'm like, you're Charles Lee? Um, you know, and he was always with black people. That's what made it even, you know, different. The only Chinese person in the room. But 
we met Charles, and, and then we let, met Vernice. And once you meet Vernice, you will never forget her. I promise you that. Um, all these kind of people working with, with government. But I, I just have to say, when people ask, and I hear this question all the time, what has changed? And I hear people say nothing has changed. That's because you didn't live 30 years ago. If you think nothing has changed, this is light years mm. in terms of the difference between the way we interact with government. You know, we literally had to lock EPA people in a room to yes, get them did. to listen to us. Yes, we did. You know, it was tough. I mean, you had to be tough, and oftentimes I was the only female in the room, and as usual, Everybody was called doctor, even people who didn't have one, like Dr. Lee. Um, and I was always called miss. Mm. That's why I almost stood up when you said miss, because it's something about that gender, <laughs> ladies, gender. Men get to be called stuff they aren't, and you are, and you don't get your own title. You know, so I was always in a room like that where I was miss. So I ended up with a reputation for saying, Dr. Beverly Wright. <laughs> And people started referring to me as that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if the janitor walked in and took a seat, he would be called doctor, but not me. That's the way it seemed most of the time. But, but it's light years. I, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Bunyan, from the time we sent the letter to EPA, it was nearly, it was certainly at least a year before we got a response. So you talk about government working slowly. It does. And I think Richard Moore and Dallas have been marching around EPA for at least six years without a meeting, demonstrating, you know, and all of this. And when we had our first meeting, the only persons they wanted in the room were Dr. Ben Chavis, Dr. Uh, Robert Bullard, Dr. Paul Mohai, Dr. Beverly Wright, they wanted no community members in that room. And we said, no, no. <laughs> you know, if community people don't come, we will not have a meeting. It was a battle, folks, and it was not easy. Mm. You know, now you get briefings on the Hill. What in the world would that, was that? <laughs> briefings on NEPA, briefings, none of that existed. You know, being really able to respond, knowing that you could, could respond to permits, none of that existed. Mm. So when young people tell me nothing has changed, I'm like, mm, you just haven't lived long enough to know things have changed drastically. And what we are expecting is not complaints from young people, but get to work and move it forward. Stop mm. complaining, get in there and work. That's what we expect from you to move it forward a bit more. So, so I'm going to stop now before you don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Uh, Dr. Boyd, let's celebrate in this moment of the HBCU leading the vanguard, leading oh. the vanguard on Climate Consortium, and, and talk to us about how that has really cultivated a, a huge landscape for movement activists and advocates. Well, let me just give you a little history. Um, the, the, when, uh, when we call for uh, creating these centers, uh, the only schools that stepped up were HBCUs. The first four or five um, centers that were created were created at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, we had no money, but we had the commitment. Um, and the fact that most of HBCUs are located in the South, in the former uh, states of the Confederacy, uh, on the front line of environmental uh, racism and housing racism and voting racism and all the racism. So it was almost like uh, it fell upon us to do what we needed to do with our partners at predominantly white institutions like Michigan in collaboration. Um, the, the fact that um, many of us who started centers and who um, were uh, doing this work early on, for example, in my case, I was at Texas Southern University. First job I, out of graduate school, it was at Texas Southern University, 1976, I got my a PhD so long ago. But two years out of graduate school, I was asked to collect data for a lawsuit, 1978, Bean versus Southwestern Waste Management. Uh, corporation. It was the first 
uh, lawsuit to challenge environmental racism using civil rights law. Mm. Uh, and the fact that uh, I had 10 students in my research methods class. You talk about activist scholar. Uh, I told my students um, sociology, I'm, I'm an untenured professor. And I get asked to do this, uh, to collect this data for this lawsuit. And, and uh, my wife at the time had sued the state of Texas. Now I worked for the state, uni uh, state university, so she had sued my employer, technically. <laughs> and, and she had sued a company, I'm not gonna call any name, but the initials of BFI, uh, headquartered in Houston, so she sued the second largest waste disposal company in the world. Um, and so uh, I, I, I had this 10 suit, we did the data, we collected it, this is long, there was no GIS mapping, there was no laptop, iPad, Google, none of that. <laughs> none of that. But we mapped it, and what we found is five out of five of the city-owned landfills in black neighborhoods, six out of eight of the city-owned incinerators in black neighborhoods, three are the privately-owned landfills in black neighborhood. 82% of all the waste dumped in Houston from the 30s up until 1978 were in black neighborhoods. Even blacks only made up 25% of the population in a city that does not have zoning. So. Uh, whether I realized or not, I was, I was becoming uh, an environmental justice activist scholar. I didn't know that, because they didn't have a name, but I did know that I graduated from the sociology department at Atlanta University that was founded by W.E.B. Du Bois, my hero, at a university that was founded by the Freedmen's Bureau, Atlanta University, 1865 to educate former slaves. So it was built in my DNA to do what I was doing. Now this is, at the time, hardly any um, sociologists or academicians knew what I was doing or what Dr. Wright was doing because this was a time when they said, what are you doing? You working on this? And they said, well, you can't, you can't get credit for that. You publish it, you can't get credit for that because it dealt with an area where there was no discipline. So it took time for people to understand and catch up that you can get tenure, you can get promoted, you can get a raise, you can get recognition, you can get an award if you do what you need to do. If you want to be an academic, you research, you publish, you write, you speak, you teach, you can do all that and some. But a lot of people discouraged us. They said, oh, you, know, you need to stay away from that. But the fact is, you have to, in some cases, go against the tide to make change. And the fact that, that we're sitting here at the University of Michigan celebrating, commemorating 30 years forward. Many of us have students who have students who have students who are doing this work. And like the Godfather, one, two, or three, he said, now, I'm going to do this favor for you now, <laughs> but you re remember when I call you, what, what you're supposed to do? You got to answer. Answer, show up. So the fact is that we're building a movement in the academy. We're building those relationships, community university partnerships, those intergenerational connections to take across the finish line. This is my last part. I always give this during the uh, interview. I said, you know, this race for justice is a race. It's no sprint, it's a marathon. No, it's a race that doesn't exist. It's a marathon relay. You run your 26 miles, you pass it off to the next generation to run 26. Yes. Now that's what I feel. I just got the last question signed, y'all. The oh. pressure is so hard to decide which question because I have so many more. Um, you know, we're in Michigan. Michigan is the important place. It's 90% of the surface freshwater in the nation, y'all. The stakes are really high. How can Michigan and where we are today help us catalyze our movement for the type of climate justice that we actually need? Does that include reparations? Does that include carve-outs for EJ communities? Does that include a Green New Deal with people of color specifically designated? Talk to me about that. 
and give it to Charles Lee. Um, wow, that's a big it's question. It's a doozy. <laughs> the, um, can I just um, back up a little bit, you know, to the, um, to the, um, to the last question about um, working, um, you know, in government and outside of government. And, sure. uh, you know, I've been, um, I've been spending a lot of time um, looking at, um, you know, progress. I mean, real progress, you know, not uh, things that are symbolic or, but real progress being made. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, not to go into a lot of detail about it, but I would say that, you know, that's always come about because of the combined efforts of communities, academia, and government. That it doesn't come about uh, without at least uh, uh, all of them working together. And, you know, um, looking from the vantage point of government, um, you know, a lot of the things which have to do with the uh, core issues of environmental justice, the government is not set up by, either by through its statutes or its uh, habits, you know, the traditions established, the normative behaviors, to understand what they are. And, um, and, and so left to itself is not going to really get to those kind of uh, uh, solutions that are necessary, you know. So it's going to take, and, you know, we don't have the time to go into, you know, a lot of examples of it, but I can guarantee you it's a, it's a combined effort of um, uh, communities, academia, and government working together. Now, the, you know, working together doesn't mean that everybody always agrees. In fact, you know, I, one example of the progress in the literature or the scholarship on environmental justice is that, you know, there's now studies that not, aren't just looking at what the negative impacts are. But what does it mean to actually implement environmental justice? And so those studies found, have found that it's always a, um, a situation where there's collaboration and conflict, that they all exist, they both exist at the same time. And that, um, you know, and you're gonna have to have both. So, you know, um, I mean, I think that, you know, to transition to your, to your question about Michigan, you know, I mean, I think that's a model. Um, there's a model for doing that that exists here already, and that you know it's really important to to build on that. And and I would say that um, that I mean, I, I just talking about Michigan and um, you know, you know, I've always said that Michigan has a really important place in the history of environmental justice in the country as a whole. You know, and that is not just a University of Michigan um, conference, and you know all that has come out of that. But it's also because of Flint, Michigan, mm. because of the resistance uh, in Flint, Michigan. And I do want to say, you know, I um, everybody here knows who uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha is, right? She's the, you know, crusading pediatrician that finally got <laughs> government to act, right? Um, and um, and um, you know, she, um, she asked me, um, I had just communicated with her, she asked me to send her regards, uh, her congratulations, and her words of solidarity uh, with all of you here. And you know that Mona was a, um, was a student of Paul and Bunyan. So she, uh, and I did a session once where, you know, <coughs> we talked about environmental justice and, and Flint and other things, and she, you know, she says, you know, this is the, the two, environmental justice and her work in public health kind of intersects together in her. You know, that's her. It's, uh, so, so I think that, that, but what Flint did was make environmental justice a mainstream concept. I would say that before that t took place, you're going to get, I mean, environmental justice had come a lot in 30 years, but I don't think most people knew what it was. Mm -hmm. But what happened with Flint and you know, and it was the it, it became something everybody can visualize, mm. you know. And no one can deny that it doesn't exist, which is also really important. And so I think that you know, I mean, we can make progress in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know things that we all do together and, and 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 build, or we can make progress through resistance. That's another way of making progress, and you know, that's just an example of this. But I think as you're going forward. You know, you think about issues like um, 
um, I guess, you know, reparations or, you know, I mean, I think the thing is, in, you're just stepping back a little bit and talking about it from the point of view of what is good uh, government policy. I mean, government exists, a good policy is about uh, addressing the needs of those who need it the most. You know, and addressing the needs of, in, in, of those communities who are the most environmentally impacted or most, uh, social, most disadvantaged. And of course, environmental justice is, you know, how you come together. And, and I think that that's, um, you know, I mean, that's the, the core part. I mean, at EPA, I think, you know, the whole point of being able to identify where these communities are is to direct more resources to them. And there's lots of mechanisms to do that. Uh, so I just stopped there because, you know, we can go on for a long time talking about this. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add one thing. Please. I, I also think that Rachel Maddow had a lot to do with the world finding out about Flint. Mm. I knew nothing, but <coughs> Rachel Maddow just drummed it. it every night so that a lot of other people, um, we, we began to start to listen a little bit more. And um, I also want to add that I think Katrina also put environmental justice on the map, even before Flint. We were dealing, you know, with the Katrina issue, and that, and that uh, certainly helped. But I want to make this one last uh, sort of pitch for um, research scholars. Um, I was reading something one time that basically said almost every movement, social change movement in this country was started by um, political scientists and sociologists with sociologists leading the pack. Hmm. And I think that in looking at my life and the way that uh, being trained as a sociologist has helped you to understand systems and, and structures and that's I think the thing that drives us to you know, move in the direction that we do. But there's something else that's required to be a research scholar and that is toughness mm. and being fearless in a way, not afraid to lose your job. You know, it's a Romney moment, if you know what I mean. <laughs> not afraid to use your job, sticking to your convictions, yeah. you know, and moving <clears throat> forward. And what I always tell young people when they're doing research and speaking out, if there's nobody that hates you, then you're not doing it right. Oh. <laughs> so when you get all the hisses and the angers and all of that, just remember, 10 years later, you may get the Heinz Award. Mm. You start getting so many awards that you want to say stop because you're ahead of the curve. So always work to be ahead of the curve and remember what's important. And that is people are important. And caring for the least of us, believe it or not, makes all of us, what, safer and better. Because if it's good for the project, you better believe it's really good for rich folks. So, you know, working for poor people really makes things better for everyone. Thank you very wow. much. <laughs> so, this will be the, the closing statement. Thank you. I know, I know they're giving us the high sign, but after him, can I go? <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say, because she asked a question about reparation, I will not let that pass. Okay. Um, yeah. I want my check, Bob. No, I told you. <laughs> no. I, you know, I yes, tell people, you know, when you say fearless, I, I tell people I do not do dead white man sociology. I do what's scientifically called kick-ass sociology. <laughs> now, on the, issue of, on the issue of reparations, you know, I am 100% in support of this commission to do the study. Anybody who is afraid of a study, mm -hmm. they got some issues with the concept before you can get to the, the whole issue of um, the findings. And so I do think that we have smart enough people in this country that can put together a commission of people who can do what needs to be done to look at the issue of reparations. And whatever those findings are, I think we should uh, look at those policy recommendations. Now, I am a supporter of that. 
Paul, thank you. And you know what? We have to shift to some questions. And with that, I think we should have another panel soon, part B, that's talking about the forward-facing issues of climate change <coughs> and the lessons that we learned from Flint and Katrina, that Flint's not fixed, right? And so whatever we do for climate justice and climate resilience must address Flint first in Michigan. So I am going to welcome up Dr. Tony Reams. Thank you so much. I give a round of applause to our panel. And yeah, Dr. let's give it up for this panel. Amazing. Thank you. All right, my heart's beating fast like Michelle's as well because I'm so excited to be up here with these folks. But um, we ask you to send us questions on Twitter, um, and we got a few questions, and I'm going to try my best in the essence of time to put this question together in one and ask that the panelists each provide us a short answer to this question. Um, and what it really is about is how we move forward. So we're celebrating uh, 30 years of environmental justice research and activism. And what we want to look at is what are we going to do over the next three decades? And so putting the questions together, um, it's really on this issue of trust or even distrust and how we work together as a movement and as activists and scholars to bring sectors together, whether it's government, whether it's the private sector, um, and how do we couch that in the history of, of distrust, but how do we build trust as we move forward in environmental justice? And I'll let Michelle start, and then we can go on down the line. <laughs> how do we build trust? We have to recognize the harm first that's been done in communities. <clears throat> And starting as if it were a, a blank slate um, doesn't work for folks. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for anybody I know. And so when we start doing the cross tabulations and putting in numbers, we have to look at the past to be able to plan for the future. All right. Thank you. Out <laughs> a bullet. We're oh. going down the line. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Literally right. down the line. Literally. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, I think there are, I think there are models um, that, that can, can set a tone for building trust. And I like to offer, you know, this is not for everybody or every place, but I do think that um, where I live, um, the HBCU Community-Based Organization uh, Consortium, Climate Change Consortium, is a great model that, that's based on um, universities uh, building partnerships and alliances with those impact communities and, and providing resources to those communities and communities developing their priorities. Uh, Dr. Wright and I uh, founded that uh, consortium and we started with five schools um, uh, in the Gulf Coast and now we expanded to at least you know, three dozen schools and um, we, we are building on something and, and it's intergenerational. It's uh, really a partnership. It's tr it's, the trust is there. Uh, we don't do experiments. Uh, we, we, you know, citizen science, community university partnerships, uh, citizens, uh, what is it called, research to action, all these things that's got names now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that trust is there. And when, when you uh, build those relationships, and people see that you are in earnest about liberating their communities from poison um, and, and fighting to the death for those communities. And uh, I think that's a good, good you, you build trust by, by building trust. There's no substitute. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I guess uh, I would say is to make sure that um, people who are um, in communities, uh, impacted communities are at the table. And that um, it's just not being at the table, but you know, what they say, um, that, that they're, um, they're recognized um, and uh, you know, what they say is being taken seriously. Thank you. Uh, so I have three things. The first is um, treat folks in the community as experts and talk to them before you develop research plans. Um, uh, often, especially, uh, I work hill adjacent. I don't work on the hill, thank God. Um, <laughs> and um, 
And what I often hear is like officers will say, I consulted on a bill, but what they meant is they wrote the bill, went to folks in communities and said, do you like it? Right. <laughs> uh, and so you have to, before you put pen to paper, go talk to people um, and, and shape your research around the things that they say and hopefully bring them in. Um, the second is don't try to do pre-work. Right, like it's trust is relationship building. So, don't from the jump throw a bunch of people in a room that you know have beef, mm -hmm. if you haven't spoken to each of them beforehand. Right, because there needs to be someone in that room that they feel comfortable with. Um, and then I think <clears throat> uh, third, um, I would say uh, you have to develop processes around what's gonna make the, the person with the least power in that room feel safe. So often, um, again, working with people in government, um, folks will be like, yeah, 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 I'm committed to justice, but they won't slow down the timeline of the bill, right? They won't uh, make different changes because this is the way it's done. But the fact is, when we do that, all you do is sort of re-entrench systems of elitism, re-entrench um, distance, right, and keep people from engaging. So just recognize that part of it might be slow, but you go slow to go fast. Once you have trust, you can move faster, uh, but that trust building stage is gonna be slower, and if that's what people require to feel safe and fully engaged is their whole selves, and that's just what you gotta do. All right, thank you. <laughs> so I will echo the, the, the concept of building trust. I think the role that was created um, for Michigan in terms of environmental justice is a public advocate role on purpose because the goal is to help bridge the gaps um, and bring people together who haven't really had conversations. And so I think letting communities speak for themselves, letting stakeholders, folks like labor, um, academia, all the different groups of folks who typically work in their own silos for their own purpose to work toward justice, bringing those folks together to have that common conversation about how to move forward, I think is a critical piece of building trust and then having gov government folks in the room who can actually give the change that's being sought at the same time to hear it. I think it's the key piece. So I think it's a combination of having the right people in the room and then having those ongoing conversations and letting frontline communities and organizations be part of that so that, like you said, Rihanna, they're at, they're at the beginning and not after something's developed. I think that's critical. Yeah, thank you. Being last is tough. I know. Right? <laughs> so everybody said about what I would say in their books written on trust, mm -hmm. building trust in communities. Um, but for me, at this point, I'm looking at who is trustworthy. Right, mm. right. You know, I, I mean, building trust with communities is not hard if you're genuine. They're looking for somebody to help them. Finding trustworthy people in government is a little bit harder, but possible. Finding trustworthy people hmm, in the chemical manufacturing, <laughs> you know, finding trustworthy people in the Department of Environmental Quality at the top, what I call Department of Environmental Inequality in Louisiana. The harder part is figuring out who you should not trust for me awesome. than it is for building trust in communities. We have no problems building trust in communities because we've been there. People look at what you do. You know, it's not what you say, but it's what you do. So if you've been working in the community, people are watching you. That's the easy part. The thing you have to watch is environmental groups selling you out. Mm. The chemical manufacturers playing really dirty, like trying to get you fired from your job. Mm -hmm. 
it's that side of it where I am at this point, end stage of career, the trust, people know me, they know Bob, they know we're not going to sell out and we, what's it, ride and die? I'm trying to get them. <laughs> they know we going down. I have to use my own language. You know, we going down together. Everybody knows that, but figuring out who in city government is really telling you the truth, that's the hard part, folks. Um, and so I agree with everything you said about trust, but figuring out who you should never trust, you know, that's the part that's hard because people will tell you anything, you know, to just calm everything down. I tell you how when I walk in a room, people would be hissing. You're like, oh, you see people groaning and moaning because I'm going to get up and say something ugly to them about some ugly thing that they did, you know, ugly about ugly that you did, um, and knowing who you can trust. Entergy, oh, the Energy Corporation in our community is Entergy. Who can you trust there? Nobody, you know, it's just at that point. So figuring out how to navigate around the untrustworthy people to form a coalition with people who are trustworthy is the challenge. That's All how right. I see it. Thank you so much. As someone born and raised in an environmental justice community in rural South Carolina, to be on this stage and to be celebrating 30 years of environmental justice research and activism and the movement um, is really inspiring. Um, I think you all have really hit on the, the tradition and the legacy of environmental justice, but you've also given us a charge to move forward. And I think Dr. Buller said it best when he said it's all right to come up here and commemorate and celebrate but we all must take this opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the fight of environmental justice. So I'll just ask everybody to hold up three fingers and let's commemorate 30 years of environmental justice, but we're moving forward for the next 30 years. All right, have a good night everybody and thank you so much.